don't really know how to Apparently our parents begin. Honestly, yeah, I We looked at inverse functions. So, F inverse of X is inverse of a function f of x if 1 f goes from domain a to codomain b and f inverse goes in the opposite direction here I'm just talking about the uh, domain and codomain And if I plug in the output of the inverse, I get the original input. And if I plug in the output of the original function into the inverse, I get the original input. This will happen for all x in the domain, well, in this situation, for all x in b. And this will be for all x in a. You find functions that do that, that relate to each other in this particular way, we say that they are inverses of each other. And we, we looked at how to compute these. Given a function f of x, I gave you the form for it. We could find the function of its inverse if it exists uh, by just switching x and y, solving for y. Um, so that's where we left off. Now I want to look at graphing inverses. So. Uh, we'll use the search x and y. Um, so basically what that means is uh, if a function, each coordinate x comma y uh, on that function would give you the function y comma x on the inverse function. So you're literally swapping x and y. Now what does this mean graphically? So, let's say here we have a function, f of x doing its thing, and suppose it passes through the point, say, uh, 0, 1. Then what that means is the inverse would have to pass through 1, 0. You're literally going to switch the x and the y coordinates. Now, you can actually do this for all of them. So this coordinate here is going to correspond with some other coordinate over here, and so on and so forth. Now, what you're going to realize is you will eventually get a graph that looks like this. Now, when you want to find a nice mechanism for getting such a graph, um, as most of you probably already know, the result is comes from actually looking at the line y equals x. So you take the line y equals x, and you literally reflect over that line. That is equivalent to computationally switching the x and y. So if you look at y equals x, and we literally just take the mirror image of each point along that line perpendicularly, we actually would get the graph of the inverse function when it exists. So that's basically the idea. So you don't need to plot points or go through any of the things that you went through to get the first graph. Uh, reflect the graph of f of x. Thank you.
that's all you need to know. However, I do want to introduce some peculiarities here, which when we get to trigonometry, you're going to realize why we have to do certain things that we're going to do. When we talk about inverse free functions, Here are some issues that uh, you might want to think about. Look at something like y equals x squared. Now we know the graph of that guy. Now, if we were to do that whole thing I just mentioned, reflect in y equals x, uh, what is the graph that would result? Well, if I take uh, this line here, duh, 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 and I literally flip all these guys over, what's going to happen is, here I had a bulge like this below the graph, so the inverse is going to have a bulge like that above. So this guy is going to look like that, and this entire wing over here is going to flip over here, and the graph is going to look like that. Now you might say, what is wrong with this? Uh, so here, notice that this is a function f of x. Uh, is this a function? It's not a function. Notice that I just swapped this thing and I got something that wasn't a function. Now, ordinarily, this might not be a big deal. Why this is a big deal is now, unknowingly, you've introduced ambiguities uh, that you'd rather not have. I also want you to notice, note, this, uh, this reflection does not yield a function. This causes ambiguities. tell you how to avoid these ambiguities, right? So this guy doesn't pass the vertical line test, it's actually not a function. Uh, for example, if I know that, so set f of x equals x squared, um, if I know that f of x equals, say, 1, uh, what is x, what would you say x is? One or negative one. <laughs> this would give you x equals one or x equals negative one. Now that is an issue because what that means is if I flip this in the reverse order, I would have a single input. So this means why this is an issue is that this means if I were to take f inverse of 1, the answer would be twofold. I would get 1 or negative 1. And then you're like, which one do I choose? Right? It's not a function when you have two inputs for one output. And because we're not sure what we would choose. Because if you tell me one, I'm not going to know, did that come from the input plus one or minus one? Because they're actually two things, and that go to one. Because uh, we won't know what to choose. We cannot reliably reverse the function, which is the whole point of what an inverse function is supposed to do. So basically what happens is, I have one thing, I have uh, two things here, minus one and plus one, that both output the same thing here. Right? So that is going in that direction, I have f. Now if I wanted to plot f inverse, and I wanted to know what does this connect to, uh, I'm not going to know. Because 
if you give me one as the output, I don't know what kind of simplification or calculation had to happen in order for me to get that one. There are multiple options, and that yields ambiguity, which means it's not a function, because the definition of a function is each input must have one output. Um, another issue. Uh, suppose, let's use the same idea. Uh, so, again, define f of x equals x squared, uh, where I'm thinking of this as a real value function, so, you, you know, complex numbers isn't going to be the answer, right? So the domain is the real numbers and the range is the real numbers. Here's another question that someone could ask. What x would make uh, f of x equal to minus 1? The square root of negative 1. x would have to be the square root of negative 1, which is not a real number. So, i.e., there is no real number that does this. Another issue. Why is that an issue? Basically, this just means to use the mapping diagram idea again. Like the only time we use mapping diagrams is to when we want to explain a concept. Uh, so here's the real numbers. That's the domain. Here's the real numbers. That's the codomain. What that means is, uh, yes, if I have one over here, it'll map to one over there. If I have minus one over here, it'll map to one over there. If I have two over here, it will map to four over there, etc. But there's a number over here, minus one that no one connects to. Now, why is that a problem? If we were to reverse this, basically what that would mean, there's a number over here, so four, one, these would, first of all, I don't know what these two actually connect to. This has two answers. This one has, again, two answers. I'm not going to know which one to pick. But more importantly, this one has nothing going there, and that's a problem. Why? Because a function is supposed to connect everyone in the domain, right? Remember, a function is a rule that connects everyone in one set, called the domain, to exactly one person in another set, called the codomain. Uh, and a function like x squared breaks all the rules. It breaks all the rules. Uh, when it comes to being able to find an inverse. It's inverse, I should say, would break all the rules. So, uh, so if I think of the function f from r to r given by fx equals x squared, we'd have to say it has no inverse function. which leads to the question, when do we have an inverse function? There's a theorem that gives us the answer. F from A to B has an inverse function. Basically, we're going to need two things that causes the issues that I just mentioned not to happen. If, so, that's a mathematical thing. Uh, I didn't, I know how to spell the word if. Uh, I didn't do two Fs uh, by accident. That actually is a shorthand for if and only if. That just means that's a mathematical statement that works in two directions at a time. Um, so if you know one side, you automatically know the other side. And if you know this side, you automatically know the other side. Uh, so uh, f has an inverse function if and only if f is 1 to 1 and on to. It's 1 to 1 and on to. Let me explain. Well, preferably a student. 
who is so eager to learn. Here's what one-to-one -one means, aka we can call it one-dash-one, one-to-one, aka use the fancy word injected if you're in polite company. We say a function is one-to-one -one or injective if the following holds. If each output has a unique input, i.e., if your f of x is equal to your f of y, then x must be equal to y. Right? Basically what that means is you have this sort of idea. Each guy here connects to one guy over there. And every other guy that connects to one guy connects to a different guy. They can't double up on outputs. Each output has to only have one guy connecting to it. That is called one to one. Now when you don't have that, so something like this guy goes to that guy, this guy goes to that guy, and this guy actually connects to someone who wasn't already connected to, this is not one to one. X squared behaves like this. Right? So you'll have plus and minus one both connecting to positive one in the codom. You don't want something like that. One to one means everyone connects to a unique person. Every output here has a unique input. Um, equivalently, you could say you can say if the inputs are not the same, then the outputs would not be the same. I want you to note f of x equals x squared is not one to one. How do I know? Well, if f of x equals x squared, then if you notice, one is not the same as minus one, but f of 1 is the same as f of minus 1. So that's that. That means the outputs are the same even though the inputs were not the same. This is bad. This means a function is not 1 to 1. Um, and automatically when a function is not 1 to 1, it is not invertible. Uh, graphically, here's what it means. So if you have a graph, you can know when a function is one to one just by looking at it. F is one to one if it passes the horizontal line test. You know how all functions have to pass the vertical line test? There is also a horizontal line test that determines a special kind of function, uh, i.e. any horizontal line y equals x cubed, this function looks like that. If I look at uh, y equals, let's say, 2 to the x, I'll talk about functions like that soon. Next week we'll talk about functions like that. That one looks like that. Uh, versus, if I look at y equals x squared, that one looks like that. I want you to notice that if I were to draw in a horizontal line, no matter where I would draw it, on this picture, it'll touch the graph one time. Uh, here, if I were to draw any horizontal line, it will touch the graph at most one time. 
Notice it might touch the graph zero times, but I don't care. Uh, it will touch it, if it touches, it should touch it one time and only one time. These are one to one. Because they, they pass the vertical line test, the horizontal line test. However, in the case of y equals x squared, draw this horizontal line here, boom, touches twice. That means not one to one. So if you're looking at a graph of a function, you realize that you can draw a horizontal line that touches it more than once, that function has no inverse. Don't waste your time looking for it. Let's talk about... So I'm not going to test you too much on this, but it is something you should kind of be aware of because um, in future classes they'll expect you to be aware of it as well as it'll make some things that I'm going to do in trigonometry and some things that you'll do later. It's going to make it make sense if you're aware of this. Um, but yeah, one to one is an issue. There's also the idea of onto, uh, aka we call this surjective when it's like. And this is basically the idea that the function doesn't miss anyone. Just like our x squared, when we try to map it to uh, minus 1, there was no input that gave us minus 1. So the idea here is f from a to b is surjective if for every element, every y that's located in b, there is at least one x located in a such that f of x will give us y, meaning another way to think of this is that the range is the codomain. i.e. the range of f is the codomain of f. i.e. everyone in the codomain is the output of someone in the domain. like that, we call it onto. So, f from r to r given by f of x equals x squared is not onto. Why? x squared looks like this. Down here, I can pick a y value minus 1, which is definitely in a, a real number, but there's no input. Whereas, if I look for at f from r to r, where my function is defined by x cubed, Notice that no matter what y value I pick, pick 17, there's going to be some input that gave me that 17. Pick minus 37.5, there's going to be some input that gave me the output minus 37.5. Whatever y value I pick, there is some x value that will give me that y value. So that is the idea of onto. Basically what that means is if we were to switch domain and codomain, the codomain can act as a, a bona fide domain. We won't be able to, you'll be able to connect everyone to something else.
So that's just something I would want you guys to be aware of. Um, only functions that are one to one and on to will have inverses. So we have to have every input gives us exactly one output and everyone in our code domain is actually the output of somebody. Once you make sure those two things are fulfilled, an inverse actually exists. Now, here's a thing that's going to be important when we talk about later things and will be important in future classes. Uh, sometimes we can restrict the domain and or codomain to obtain an invertible function. So let's give me give you an example. Here is uh, once again our guy who couldn't catch a break, y equals an x squared. Right? Which messed up on all accounts when it comes to being able to invert it. Um, here's one thing though. I could restrict this function so that a part of it that I care about is invertible. Notice that if I were to take all x's from 0 and bigger, so in other words, uh, if I set the, the uh, domain to be 0 to infinity, so I only care about inputs that are zero or bigger. And at the same time, I would set the codomain to also be zero or bigger, which means I don't care about the negative y-axis. So if this is the entire universe, right? So I'm, I don't care about the negative y's. The green part is going to be a one-to-one -one and onto function. For every y value I pick up here, there will be an input that gives me that y value. The y values down here, as far as I'm concerned, they don't exist right now. This part of the function, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't exist right now. If I only care about the green part, that's a one-to-one -one onto function. It passes the horizontal line test, and it outputs every possible output. So if I were to restrict x squared, so. of x squared from all the positive numbers mapping out to all the positive real numbers, including 0. That's how we sometimes write that notation. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to use it. Pretty much I'm, this is the only time I'm going to use it in this class. Um, so if I look at the function x squared, but I think of my domain as all numbers 0 or bigger, and my codomain as all numbers 0 or bigger, then this is invertible. In fact, it's inverse. Is another familiar function, the square root of x. This will be the function that will reverse everything. So this would be the part of the function I care about. And if I reflect in the line y equals x, this will be the resulting function. This is y equals the square root of x. That's why the graph of the square root of x function looks like that. Um, notice uh, there is no ambiguity. Each in this is also a one-to-one -one and onto function on the same range of code. So, just again to be clear. Uh, These are ideas I want you to be aware of. Because, for instance, whenever we're talking about this sine inverse and tangent inverse and cosine inverse, you're going to realize that technically we can't actually do that the way they're defined. How we're going to create those functions, we're going to slice off a little part of the sine function to get the sine inverse function. And 
that's what's going to be happening when I, when I actually do it. You're like, why are you doing that? This is why am I why am I doing it? Um, so uh, we'll see that later. Uh, these are ideas I want you to be aware of. Don't test you on. It's important as, on a conceptual basis uh, what you need to know. check if two functions are inverse of each other. In which case you plug one into the other and see if you get x as the hit. How to check if two given functions are inverse of each other. Another thing I would expect you to know, given a function, So the idea, whenever I would ask this, it would automatically be the case that the function would be invertible, given an invertible function. So I, I might not tell you to have to check whether it's invertible. Given an invertible function, find the formula for its inverse. And that is switch x and y solve for y. So you should, you should know how to do that. And lastly, in terms of inverse functions, the next thing I want you to know is given the graph of an invertible function, skills, right? Not to say that what I just did wasn't important because it is. I wouldn't have spent class time on it if it wasn't. There are a lot of things in a little bit later in this class, but more importantly in your future classes where understanding this idea of one-to-one -one and onto is going to make a lot of things make sense. If you don't understand those, a lot of things won't make sense. You know, well, how do you do that? I don't understand. Right, we don't want that. Uh, but as far as inverse functions go, these are the things I expect you to be able to do. If I give you two functions, you should be able to figure out are they inverse of each other. What that means is you take one, plug into the other, make sure you calculate you get x, then take the first one, plug into the second one, calculate. Do you get x both times? Then they're inverse of each other. If you don't, they are not. Uh, if I gave you a formula for a function, could you find the form for the in inverse of the function? So I'm going to say, here's a function, find the formula for its inverse, right? So whenever I say that, it will be invertible. You won't need to check if it's one to one or onto. Uh, but you're going to switch the x and y. You're going to solve for the y. Also, there are times when I might give you a graph of a function. Here's the graph of a function. It will be invertible. Find the graph of its inverse. And you need to know, OK, I'm going to draw the line y equals x, and I kind of just move over everybody to the other side. So those are the actual testable skills at this point. Um, but knowing all this stuff in the background is going to make your mathematical journey uh, a lot less stressful for those of you who have to go much farther. So in the remaining time, uh, I want to do another topic. Let's move on. I think at this point we are in, I want to say 3.3. I don't always put the section topics, but this for this, this for some reason I remember to write it this time. Uh, we're gonna look at division of polynomials. So kind of a change in pace here. Uh, here's something I wanted to recall because I'm going to do the long division version uh, because there's also something called synthetic division, but it has limitations. Which I want to learn in a whole new method, and it has limitations. Okay, recall long division. So you may do long division. I normally don't do long division uh, when doing division by hand, but it is something you would need to know to understand what I'm going to talk about. So 
here's an example. If I wanted to find, uh, say, 47 divided by 2, let me remind you of the long division way of doing this. You write this word thing that looks like that. You put 47 under this, and you put the 2 under over here. Okay. You're familiar, remember this? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the 2, you're going to divide into the 4. The result will be 2, so you put the 2 up here. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take the 2, you're going to multiply the 2 here, and you're going to put the result underneath. So I'm going to take the 2 times the 2, I will get a 4, I put it underneath, and then you subtract that thing from the above. That will give you a 0. Then the next guy, you drop it down, and you continue this process. So here you have 0, 7, which is zero, it's just 7. Uh, 2 into the 7 goes 3 times, 3 times 2 is 6, put the 6 underneath, subtract. You will notice that you would have 1 at the answer. Now you take 2 into that 1, but 2 does not divide into 1. This guy, as long as, as once you get smaller than this guy, you stop, stop. This is smaller than 2. This is a, what we call, remainder. So that's what remains after me going through this process for as long as possible. Now, what this tells you the answer is. So how do you write down the answer once you run through this process? This means 47 divided by 2 is... Well, you're going to write the number that you have up here, which is 23, plus you are going to write the remainder, which in this case is 1, and you're going to divide by the 2, which is the divisor. And so it's 23 and a half, or it's 23 and a half. Okay. So that's how we would actually do the long division. 2 into 47 goes 23 and a half times. Um, so, whenever you are in this thing and you're going through and you are left over with a result at the last step, call this. So let's say you are, here you have some expression A, here you have some expression B, uh, here you have some expression C, here's some expression D. Uh, the names for these. A is called the divisor. C is called the quotient. D is called the remainder. Uh, B is called the Dividend. But almost no one <laughs> mentions that guy actually. Okay, so, uh, and the result of this, so the result is going to be the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor which you can find by going through this process, right? So that's the division of the uh, result. Uh, so the result of taking B and dividing by A, you write it out in this form, and that's how we actually divide. Anyone not used to long division need another example here? Okay, we're gonna put this on steroids now. Okay. <laughs> So once you understand it with numbers, the idea is you can also do this with things that aren't numbers, namely polynomials.
So let's do, let's walk through some examples. I will teach you how to do this as we're doing it. Learn as you go, active learning, all that good stuff. Uh, so here. Suppose I want to take x squared minus x plus 3, and I wanted to divide that by x minus 2. Suppose I take 4x cubed plus x minus 5, and I want to divide that by 2x plus 1. Suppose I took x squared plus 5xy plus 6y squared, and I want to divide that by x plus 2y. And that last example is going to give us something interesting uh, to segue into the next uh, phase. So let's do the first one. you will discover sometimes sounding like you know what you're talking about is just as important as knowing what you're talking about. Right, so you know the thingy, you don't want to you don't want to be explaining something, you know the thingy on the bottom, no, say it's the divisor. And they're like, oh this dude knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, it's it's very important that people think you know what you're talking about. Okay, so um, what we would do is the guy that goes after the division sign, that is the divisor. So we are going to write x squared minus x plus 3. Now there's a little bit about the setup here that I'll explain in part B, but this one we don't have to really worry about it. Okay, so here's how the process is going to go. Um, the only difference between this and the numbers version is that the bigger guy is the one that leads the charge. You, you do everything in terms of the biggest guy. So, you're going to take x, divide into x. What is the result? x. You will then take this x, and you're going to multiply everyone. So that's how the 2 comes into play. So x times x, you get x squared. x times minus 2, you get minus 2x. You're going to subtract that entire line. Okay. Now what's going to happen? The x is going to kill each other. You're going to get 0 over here. Then you have minus x plus 2x. That leaves you with 1x as that result. The 3, you bring down. So now you've done this, and you're left over with this, and you repeat. You're going to take x, divide into x. That goes 1 times, so put a plus 1 here. I'm going to take that plus 1, and I'm going to multiply the x. This is the x. Take the plus 1, multiply minus 2. I get minus 2, and I'm going to subtract that line. The x's will kill each other. And then I'd be left over 3 minus a minus 2. That gives me plus 5. Notice there are no x's anymore. The process stops. So this means that if I'm to take x squared minus x plus 3 and divide that by x minus 2, the result is going to be x plus 1 plus the remainder 5 over the divisor of x minus 2. That's going to be the answer. Questions? Now, there are some issues that can happen if you write things down sloppily, which I'm going to help uh, talk about in part B. Um, once you guys finish copying this, we'll do part B. And we'll do a few more examples after this to get you used to the, the process. <laughs> if it's been a while or you've never seen this before, we'll do a few more examples. Yes? Is there a shortcut when x equals 1? You can write Yes, there is something called synthetic division, which um, 
it looks like this thing, you mean? Yeah. And then you would put the yeah. two out here, and then you would put the coefficients of the x, so that's 1, minus 1, 3. And how it goes is that you drop this one down here, and then you take or you 2 times 1, you get 2, and then you add these two, you get a plus 1, and then uh, you 2 times 2, 2 times 1, you get 2, Again? And then you have, yeah, exactly that. And then you get five. Yeah. And then what you know is that all the powers are shifted. So it's like if this was the x squared, this is the x, and this is the constant, then in your answer, this is like the x, this is like the constant, and this is like the remainder. And so you would have one uh, x plus one, plus 5 as the remainder. Uh, the problem with this, though, is this is restricted. Um, so pretty much when you're dividing by x minus 2, you take the negative of the constant, and that's what you put on the outside here, and you do the process with that. Um, but this process only works with monic linear terms. Yeah, I, I defined that word a long time ago. That means the coefficient of x is 1. So it has to look like 1x plus a. Now, the moment you say you're divided by 2x plus something, like I asked you here, this doesn't work anymore. What you would have to do is you would have to divide out the half. You think of it as, as x plus a half or something like that. And then you would put the minus a half here, and you would do that. If you want to divide something by a, uh, like a quadratic, then this is not going to work. Right? So this works in a very specific circumstance. It's when you're dividing by pretty much something that looks like this. Two terms where the coefficient of x is 1. Uh, this will work. Um, if you have two terms where the coefficient of x is not 1, well, you kind of factor out a half out of the whole thing, and you think of this as x plus 1 half instead, and do this process with the 1 half up here. But once things start getting bigger, uh, it's, it, you can't really do it. It's a whole other method, and it, because it has all these restrictions and little nuances, I decided not to learn it and hence not to teach it. I'm not opposed to new ways of doing things, but it has to be at least as good as the way I'm already doing it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's synthetic division. If you like it, you can do it. I will understand what you're doing and grade you accordingly, so it's not like you're going to trick me if you do synthetic division. Uh, but in general, I probably prefer it this way um, because it works more general. Let's look at B. The tips. So there are some issues that can happen here when you don't really set things out right. So, for example, uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is that, so tip one, write the powers in descending order. So even if I were to flip this around and tell you, oh, it's minus 5 plus x plus 4x cubed, you would still write it in the order 4x cubed plus x minus 5. Um, so you always want the powers to be in descending order. Uh, tip 2. Account for all powers when they don't appear originally. Uh, 
for this thing to work, things have to line up a certain way. So you might notice here, the highest power here is a cube, but there's no squared power. It doesn't mean that you just literally ignore the square power. You have to account for it. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to write 4x cubed. And either some people like to leave a space, but if you don't like that, you actually write in 0x squared. You need the, the, the line for the x squares. Because once things get out of order, it's going to be confusing and you're going to mess yourself up. Okay. So I'm accounting for the square power, even though it doesn't actually show up. And then I count down to the first power. Then I count down to the zero power. Right? So even if things don't show up, leave a space for it or write, write in zero times what that thing was. So you have all the powers in descending order. Three, two, one, zero. Right? Descending order, everyone's accounted for. Uh, if it doesn't show up in the original, put in a zero. Um, that is not so much so important for this, but you still follow the tip of writing this in descending order. So you'd write this as 2x plus 1. Do not write it as 1 plus 2x. Right? And don't jumble the order here. Everything is in descending order. And especially under this sign, account for all the powers. Even if they don't show up, leave a space for them. It's very important because things have to line up. And be sure to line up like powers. And that's uh, that's basically it. So that, that's some issues that could happen. So to troubleshoot, uh, but let's actually do this process real quick. So, am I doing enough space here? Let's copy that. So, 2x plus 1, 4x cubed, leave a space for the 0x squared, plus x minus 5. I can write it in in case it's bothering you. Okay, so we're going to do the original process. Uh, x squared. X squared. So remember, the first guy is what you're focusing on. So you're looking at the 2x. You're going to divide into everybody. 2x into 4x cubed. 2x squared. 2x squared. Take the 2x squared, multiply everybody. 2x squared times this gives me 4x cubed. 2x squared times 1 gives me 2x squared. Now notice that I wrote the 2x squared underneath the x squared. Right? It's lined up. Now, if you're in the situation where you forgot to write the space, you put the x over here, now things are going to get jumbled, it's going to start getting confusing, and they don't actually cancel each other. But we're going to subtract that line. First cube kills the 4x cube. Now I have 0x squared minus 2x squared. Minus 2x squared. So, now I repeat the process. 2x into 2x squared. negative x, the 2's would cancel and the x's would cancel leaving you over 1x. x times this gives me the minus 2x squared. Minus x times 1 gives me minus x. Notice that it's lined up with the other x. And I'm going to subtract that line. The minus 2x squared will kill the minus 2x squared. And here I would have plus x minus a minus x. That will give me 2x. <coughs> Then I'm going to do the same thing. 2x into 2x, that goes 1 time. 1 times 2x, 2x. 1 times 1, plus 1. I'm going to subtract this line, and this is lined up with 5. Now, the 2x kills the 2x. Minus 5, minus 1, leaves me with minus 6. And the process stops. I can't take the 2x into the minus 6. So. This means the answer is going to be 
uh, 2x squared minus x plus 1 minus 6 over 2x plus 1. That's the result of uh, this division. So following these is going to uh, prevent a lot of headache. Uh, make sure you write powers in descending order. Account for lower powers even when they don't show up. Leave a space or put a zero times that power. Uh, and once you're going through the long division process, make sure that the powers are lined up. The cubes are in one line, the squares are all in one line, the x's are all in one line, the constants are all in one line. Because sometimes just misaligning something causes people to get confused and get the wrong answer. Okay, try C. Two minutes. xy minus the 2xy, so you get 3xy, then? Subtract. This kills that. And 
The remainder is zero. Huh? What does that mean? Well, <laughs> basically, uh, what this means is that if I were to take x squared plus 5xy plus 6y squared and divide that by x plus 2y, uh, the result is going to be x plus 3y uh, plus 0 remainder. Now, what's neat about having 0 remainder? So plus 0 remainder. Now, here's what this means. I can multiply both sides by the x plus 2y. And I would get what? Well, I would get the x plus 3y times the x plus 2y. In other words, I just figured out a way to factor that by using division. long division to help us figure out how to factor things. This is going to lead to a whole new factoring methodology. So here is uh, one example of how we're going to do that. Look at this guy. Factor this polynomial. If I know that x plus 4 a factor. So that's an important kind of problem. I'm going to ask you how to do uh, something like that <coughs> for sure on the next test and on the final. Now, of course, we remember the, uh, hopefully, we remember the principles. Um, you always want to try to get away with the simplest idea possible um, all the time. So, like I said, if difference of squares and difference of cubes applies to a problem, you want to try difference of squares first, etc. Um, so, when I see the word factor and I see some expression I want to factor, go to the basic principles first. Is there a GCF? No, right? That's always the first thing you look for. Okay, there are two terms, so difference of squares, difference of cubes, not going to work. There aren't three terms, so the AC method or something similar is not going to work. There are four terms. When I see four terms, what do I think about? Factor by grouping. That's the first thing that should come to mind. So now you're like, okay, factor by grouping. Let's deal with that. Boom, common term here, x squared. I would be left over with an x plus 10. Boom. Well, no common term. I, I could factor out a 1. But the problem is I'd be left over with a 29x plus 20 which is not going to be the same as x plus 10. For factor by grouping to work, I need to have the same thing in parentheses that I can factor out. So, no GCF if factor by grouping does not work. Okay, so those would be the first thing I would think of. However, there is a hint given. Uh, I know that x plus 4 is a factor. Uh, basically what this means, Uh, that if I were to take x cubed plus 10x squared plus 29x plus 20, it will factor into x plus 4 times a couple things I don't know. But I know that that's one of them, right? So that's what this is telling me. So what does that actually mean? Well, this would mean that if I were to take x cubed plus 10x squared plus 29x plus 20 and divide both sides by that, I would be able to figure out what the other two things are. Right? So, I give you something, I tell you that something is a factor. How are you going to figure out how to factor the thing? Well, you're going to actually divide the thing I gave you into the thing you have. So, the first step, divide. So, I'm going to have the x plus 4 divide into this guy. Uh, I have the x cubed power, the x squared power, x power and the zero power. And we're going to do the process. Uh, x into x cubed goes x squared. x squared times this gives us x cubed. x squared times that gives us 4x squared. Subtract. x cubes kill each other. Uh, 
10x squared minus 4x squared gives us 6x squared. Repeat the process. x into 6x squared goes 6x. 6x times this gives me 6x squared. 6x times 4 gives me 24x. Subtract all that. These guys kill each other. 29x minus 24x will give me 5x. x into 5x goes 5 times. 5 times x gives me 5x. 5 times 4 gives me 20. Subtract this line, the 5x is kill each other, and I would have 20 minus 20. I get 0, which is good. So what that means, is that x cubed plus 10x squared plus 29x plus 20 divided by x plus 4, that's going to give me x squared plus 6x plus 5. Do you factor that out and then you get the other two factors with that? Come in? Do you just factor the, the, that out? No, never no, mind. Just, never mind. Okay, yeah, continue. Sorry. Yeah. Now, it turns out that this guy actually factors. Right? What does that factor do? x plus 1, x plus 5. Which means if I were to multiply both sides by x plus 4, this means that my x cubed plus 10x squared plus 29x plus 20 actually factors into x plus 4 times x plus 1 times x plus 5. And I just found a way to factor that. We're going to learn how to do this without me actually giving you this hint. What if I didn't tell you that? It turns out you'd still be able to figure that out. And I'll tell you next time. How. What, what's the question? You're going to need something called the rational rooster. I'll tell you about next time.